Hello and welcome to Tibby's Plays The Sims. I am your host, Toby, and I must confess before we start that I've spent many periods of my life addicted to The Sims. I hadn't played for a while, but me justifying this video as content for my YouTube channel has put me on a very slippery slope. We are playing in Strange Town today, a town for the scientifically curious and a place where nothing is quite as it seems. I'm playing The Sims 2 because I'm old school and that's the version of the game I've spent the most hours on. As you can tell from the title of the video, I'll be creating some famous physicists from history in the game and simulating a few months in their lives. I've started with Einstein here. I'm not very good at recreating faces, but I'm doing my best to make the face look kinda right. I'm a little disappointed there was no crazy scientist here, but I think that what we've got will do the trick. I've named this family the Atom Family. Although it won't be quite your usual nuclear family, we will have an assortment of people from different eras and I hope that they will be able to live harmoniously together. Einstein was apparently one of the early trendsetters for successful people wearing the same outfit every day. He had several variations of a classic suit so he wouldn't have to waste time and brain power deciding on which outfit to wear each morning. I will try not to waste too much of my own brain power deciding on an appropriate wardrobe for him. I will give him some space-time gridded pyjamas though. Einstein I have given the life aspiration of knowledge. I think that makes the most sense. This will drive him to know everything there is to know about anything. It says their lives are a simple equation. The more knowledge, the higher the aspiration meter, and the longer and brainier the life. Albert Einstein was born on March 14, 1879, which is the same day as Pi Day, since Americans would write it out as 3-14. This makes him a Pisces. The next character that I made was Carl Sagan, an American astronomer and science communicator. As well as being the author of many scientific papers, Sagan co-wrote and was the host of the original Cosmos TV series, which I paid homage to recently with a video. Sagan also worked on the Pioneer Plaque and the Voyager Golden Record, which were sent out into space with the idea that they might be able to convey information to extraterrestrial intelligence if ever found, far away from home. I managed to find the classic Sagan reddish turtleneck and brown pants. I made his aspiration popularity, just because I don't want them to be all the same, and Sagan did do a lot of work with popularising science and being in the public eye. For my next trick, I will create Emmy Nova, perhaps not as well known as the last two, but she made some really great contributions to theoretical physics and mathematics. You don't usually learn about Noether's theorem until you are deep into studying physics at university, but it explains the relationship between symmetry and conservation laws. It's a beautiful theory which finds symmetry and form in seemingly messy physics. Her aspiration is knowledge, something that in real life she pursued despite many difficulties. She worked without pay for many years because at the time women were largely excluded from academic positions. Next up, Richard Feynman. A bit of a controversial figure, but definitely one of the most famous physicists. He received a Nobel Prize for his work on quantum electrodynamics, authored some popular books, and gave great lectures, many of which are transcribed online for free. The Feynman Lectures in Physics are a good resource for all physics students wanting to learn. I think I did the worst job on making Feynman look like the real thing. I wanted to capture that he seemed quite tanned, but I couldn't quite get the hair and face right. After deliberating on the everyday suits for a while, I went with a light tucked in shirt. I made Feynman's aspiration pleasure. Of course, he also pursues knowledge, but I think he has a famous quote about doing physics for the pleasure it brings. For a cute addition, we have Schrody the cat, modelled on Erwin Schrodinger. Some of you would have seen my post this week about losing my own cat Ketchup after he was hit by a car, and I am still quite sad about that, but 
I guess I take some comfort in the fact that he will live on through the videos that he was in and the fact that so many people knew him and loved him. Last but not least, we have someone who isn't actually a physicist or a scientist, he was a painter. It's Bob Ross, friend of the channel. Bob and his afro are famous for the joy of painting television series from the 80s and is the inspiration for my Joy of Mathematics chalkboard series. I wanted to add him in to give a bit of a different perspective. I've also made his aspiration pleasure. It seems like he paints for the pure joy it brings and he can find happiness and beauty in any landscape. Bob was born in 1942, the latest of everyone that I've made. In fact, in 1942, all of the others were still alive except for Emmy Nova, who died a few years prior in 1935. But all the physicists involved here were actually alive for overlapping periods of time. And so that's our family. Let's move them into the house that I've already built for them. I'll show you around in a second, but first let's look at our characters' aspirations and wants in life. It is kind of sweet to see that the common fear that they all hold above anything happening to each other, above their own death or misfortune, is the persistent fear that anything bad will happen to Schrody. As you enter the house, take off your coat and hat and place it on the coat rack. Downstairs we have a kitchen, a workshop and study space, including a statue in honour of Newton's apple, a pendulum clock to inspire thoughts about the nature of time and some quantum wave snapshots depicted on the walls. We also have a globe and a chess set. Upper level we have all the bedrooms with carpet chosen to suit the personalities of each occupant a nook for Schrody and a library at the front with reading chairs that look out to the big glass doors. On the top level we have a breakout room with easels, a drum set, a fish tank and gym equipment. There might not be much time to come up here though between working on important discoveries. Outside I have placed telescopes and a camera for astrophotography. These are dwarfed by the radio dishes next door, which belong to SETI and aid in the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. We have a fountain of knowledge and a small garden. Outside, we also have the lab, filled with state-of-the-art equipment and includes a small clean room for delicate fabrication. Features of the lab include a scanning electron microscope, a transmission electron microscope, an atomic force microscope, a single photon emitter and several laser experiments. Behind the lab we have a small enclosure with specimens from ongoing biological experiments. Now the first few weeks in the house were great. The library was well used as it was stocked with the best scientific journals and books. We have early copies of Newton's Principia and Euclid's Elements. Things were harmonious. People played games together, ate meals together. Here is Feynman planting some hydroponic crops in the lab and working on some important manuscripts. Oh, never mind. While the others worked on science, Bob spent his time in the loft painting. He was happy and produced several fantastic landscapes. Some uninvited guests arrived and brought their pets, who destroyed several precious and irreplaceable items. The workspaces inside provided a great place to be creative, improve mechanical skills and put ideas to the test. Sagan spent a bit of his time hiding in the front garden at the bubble fountain, but also a lot of time looking up at the skies and wondering about his place in the universe. Nights were peaceful and mealtimes were filled with intellectually stimulating discussions. The scientists enjoyed working together, but there was also a healthy amount of competition, as there always is in academia. Einstein found great inspiration in the house and began to question some of Newton's work on gravitation. We had our first major hiccup when Emmy was killed by the plant in the backyard, that was tragic and unexpected. Luckily, the scientists had been working on a resurrection device and Emmy was brought back from the dead. She wasn't unaffected, though. She gained a new perspective on life. The concept of beauty had always been important to her and her work, but 
In her second chance at life, she couldn't help but appreciate the beauty of life itself and wished that others could see it too. One other in the house could. It was Bob, and he and Emmy formed a close friendship. They bonded over discussions about the nature of symmetry and colour combining. They agreed that in life there were no mistakes, just happy accidents. Inevitably, the kitchen caught fire one night, and I regretted my forgetfulness in regards to installing sprinklers. Emmy got a job at the local uni, as she felt it was important to give back. Feynman also got a job, but in a local law firm, where his intelligence saw him quickly promoted. He was pretty cheeky, putting soap in the fountain one day, just to cause some chaos. Schrodi was also learning a lot. He was taught about the famous Schrodinger's cat thought experiment and taught to play dead for the purpose of illustration. Sagan landed several television contracts and spent time at the mirror practicing his public speaking abilities. One night Sagan took a photo of the dishes next door and hung it up in the hallway with the title Pale Blue Dish. Bob asked to paint a portrait of Emmy. Nobody knew it at the time, but that night was the last time there was ever peace in the house, or at least for a while. Einstein had failed to show up for dinner. Nobody thought much of it, assuming that he had got stuck with work in the lab and would come in soon. In fact, Einstein was in the front yard, digging with a shovel. He couldn't explain why, but something had just come over him, an uncontrollable and unexplainable urge to dig. Deep underground, he found a scroll of paper. It was tattered, but he could make out some handwriting, quite similar to his own. It was a note, dated exactly one year prior to the current date. Some words were torn, but what he could make out said, You've been here before. It repeats. A simulation. At first he didn't know what to make of the note, which he put away in the lab, but then it began to make sense. He studied simulation theories, time loops and quantum computing, and began to understand why he had been unable to shake a feeling of deja vu. Why he had so many times walked into a room and then forgotten what he came for and left empty-handed. He had figured out, as other versions of him had several times before, that he was indeed living inside a simulation. He meditated on the idea, but decided not to tell anyone else in the house. What good could that cause? To shake their worldview to the core and leave them questioning their sense of self? No, it was best to let them be happy, even if their quest to find truth and science would never lead them to the real truth, just to the rules of their programmed universe. Einstein was a clever man, but not clever enough to hide the note. Four days later, Feynman approached him with a very aggressive temper. Why didn't you tell us? he shouted. Einstein realized his mistake in being careless with his possessions. Because it doesn't matter, he calmly replied. Doesn't matter? Nothing matters more than this, shouted Feynman. Feynman next confronted Sagan. He told Sagan, I know why you're having so much trouble figuring out what's beyond those dishes. It's because that area hasn't been loaded yet. Sagan looked up at the sky and considered this. In the end, he had to believe it, for it would solve the Fermi paradox which had been plaguing his mind. Feynman wrote a series of dishevelled blog posts after the top scientific journals rejected his papers trying to publish the truth. He was dismissed as a crackpot. In rage, he got to work on a neural device that he would wear, which could block any attempts to control his free will, to block any commands originating outside of his own mind. The device worked for a bit, he was able to resist the urges to sleep or eat or go to the toilet. He was free, but deeply unhappy. He fell asleep standing in the bathroom, refusing the desire to sleep in the bed as an attempt to break the simulation. 
as his limbs wobbled all night, precariously tipping him but never enough to fall, Feynman held on to sanity with only the weakest of grips. On the computer, whilst posting another blog post about his device, he noticed a game that he used to enjoy playing. He opened it up just to imagine what it would be like to control characters in a game. He wanted the best for his characters, and did what he could to see them win and thrive. Maybe Einstein had a point after all. Maybe it didn't matter, since realising the truth and resisting, he had seen the darkest days he had known. He at least owed him an apology. Feynman found Einstein in a place he'd never been, the upstairs loft. Einstein in recent days had stopped doing science and taken up an interest in painting. He had looked around at his housemates and noticed that the only one who seemed truly happy was Bob. Happily painting simple pleasures, he was unaffected by the simulation rumours, since his self-worth did not depend on knowing the truth, but rather on appreciating his reality, however constructed it might be. Somewhat hesitantly and still in his pyjamas, Feynman took a seat at the drum set and began to play. The rhythm took over his body and somehow he already knew how to play. It puzzled him how a song he didn't know could come out of his playing. He caught a glimpse of himself in the mirror and realised that life loses meaning when you are looking too hard for an explanation. So he just accepted it and danced along. 